Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be hailing from. My name is Eric, the IT Guy Hendricks, and you have landed on RHEL Presents episode 51. Today, we're going to be talking about performance enhancing Red Hat Enterprise Linux. And uh, that that greeting has, uh, has a beautiful ring to it today as, as we're calling all the way back to episode one to bring back uh, the original host of RHEL Presents. Uh, but before that, I have to introduce the current uh, co-host of RHEL Presents, and that would be Mr. Brian Smith. Hey, Eric. How's it going? Going good. Going good. So, I mean, we survived. We, we made it to episode 51. Uh, I mean, 50 in, in the bag, and I'm a little concerned about our guest today. He's, he's trouble. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> With that said, I am talking about the one, the only, Mr. Scott McBrien. Oh, now I have to live up to the hype. That's going to be scary. <laughs> You're welcome. Uh, if if you haven't met him, Scott McBrien is my partner in crime every Friday at noon Eastern for Into the Terminal, and he was actually the original host of RHEL Presents. Uh, he and Chris Short kicked this off over two and a half some odd years ago, so very, very happy to be uh, following him in his footsteps and causing trouble against the uh, across the entire of the, the interwebs, uh, but glad to have you on as, as our special guest today, uh, Scott. Well, thank you for having me, Eric. Yeah, welcome, Scott. Yeah, super exciting topic today to talk about rail performance. Um, so, Scott, tell us about uh, your background here at Red Hat, and then let's get right into it and talk about performance on rail. Yeah, so uh, in terms of my background at Red Hat, I've worked at Red Hat since dinosaurs roamed the earth. I actually killed um, woolly mammoths and ate them while re running Linux. Um, <laughs> but... Uh, currently, I work with Eric, as he mentioned, doing technical contributions for the Red Hat Enterprise Linux team. And one of my um, topics of expertise is I work with our performance engineering team, uh, amongst others. So uh, I think that that is probably the, the likely reason why uh, you guys invited me on today is to talk some about raw performance and experience with performance engineering. Oh, I thought we were talking about career performance metrics today. Oh, then you fail. You're fired. <laughs> well, there you have it, folks. So there, there's a lot of misconceptions around the definition of performance when we're talking about an operating system. So I, I, don't, I don't foresee anything I can do to my kernel or to my systemd service to drastically change the way that my, perform, uh, my, my server instance behaves. But what can I expect? What, how would you define performance? Yeah, so that's actually a really hard thing. So um, I, you're right. There are a lot of smart people at Red Hat who make a lot of decisions to try and make performance. So out of the box, I think that uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is tuned to do pretty well for most things. Um, we actually have a team at Red Hat called the Performance Engineering Team. Uh, you might have run into some other folks like Douglas Schachselberger, uh, who runs that team and has done a ton of summit presentations and other stuff on raw performance. But his team is really about doing benchmarking um, and measuring how well RHEL does on certain specific workloads. And so, for example, right now, that team is focusing on um, running benchmarks on RHEL in cloud on specific instance types. Uh, so, for example, like uh, if I'm running a database workload and it's a heavily operated system, um, so it should be like at the max of the benchmark, which instance should I choose from my cloud provider? Um, so that's that's what performance engineering is mostly geared towards, is running benchmarks and then in the like uh, beta development time period, they're actually doing that across our um, our release candidates or our beta candidates for RHEL, and then highlighting places where performance is worse than it was in the previous version of RHEL, because we don't want to be publishing a version of RHEL that does worse at something than the previous version, right? So like uh, RHEL 9 should be better on databases than RHEL 8, um, given things like the hardware being identical between the two. And so if there's a discrepancy during that beta period, uh, they will then highlight that and dig into it and figure out like what's happening with the kernel engineers so that we can get it resolved before we actually publish, um, publish RHEL. 
So that's that's one piece of performance. And when we talk about performance at Red Hat, uh, that's probably the vein in which people think about it, right? Of like benchmarking and getting the most out of their hardware for the type of workload that they're doing. Um, but I think that there's a different measure of performance, which is probably more what people use out in the world, right? So um, when we we're coming onto the show, I mentioned that we had done a um, what we call a top tasks analysis, where we survey a whole bunch of Red Hat Enterprise Linux users. And we ask them about what they do. Um, and a lot of them said that the uh, most important thing that they did at work was troubleshoot, or actually they said uh, diagnose performance problems on, uh, on applications. And then they also said that was one of the most difficult things for them to do. Which we all know how those problems often present themselves. It's usually you get a call at about 8.03 in the morning. You just sat down with your coffee and you're not, elo- not even logged into your laptop yet. And someone calls and says, hey, XYZ application is slow. Fix it. 8.03 in the morning. I think it's more like uh, 7 p.m. on Saturday night. <laughs> well, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we're like... 3.03 a.m. where you're like smashing at the yeah. uh, bedside that's, table to try and that's find That's been my experience home. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Performance doesn't sleep, that's for sure. Yeah, exactly. But, or I should but say so if we're describing, performance. But we're describing performance that way. I think it from the like Red Hat side of things, we'd probably more describe that as troubleshooting, right? Rather than performance. Because we're not doing engineering to figure out how to improve something. It's like diagnosing and resolving an issue with something that's acute, right? Rather than chronic across the entire system. Um, and so if we're describing it that way, then we have a whole bunch of applications and stuff to help uh, gather statistics and metrics and other things to help with that diagnosis. So how, how, does, how does monitoring fit into this? into this, um, into this workflow? Like where, where do you see monitoring as far as, you know, working on performance topics? Yeah. So monitoring, um, for, that's another term that like, whoa, let's step back and say, what do we really need my monitoring? So to me, monitoring would be, uh, I am gathering data consistently. And when a piece of data is unexpected, I should tell somebody about it, right? So some really um, common monitoring applications out there are things like um, Nagios, Cacti, or Zabbix, right? And so those are looking for specific um, system events. And when those system events occur, it notifies someone that that problem exists. And it's important to note that, uh, as far as I know, we do not ship any monitoring products in Red Hat Enterprise Linux. All, right, all the ones I just said are either uh, via community or uh, they're certified through our partner ecosystem, but we don't ship monitoring software. We do, however, ship a whole bunch of software that gathers data and can do so consistently. But where we like fall off is that whole notifying someone that something is out of a set threshold, we don't do that. So we, we've got the distinction between sort of the engineering focus approach to performance um, and the sysadmin troubleshooting and monitoring piece. Uh, so I, I imagine most of our viewers are probably in that position where they're getting the call at the random time of day or night and they want to know how how do I fix this or how do I prevent this what are some tools that you would recommend to to really as a sysadmin to set yourself up for success yeah so the first thing to recognize is that um, the <clears throat> other thing that is kind of in imbued in performance is tuning uh, and at the very top of the episode I mentioned that uh, there are really smart people at Red Hat that make decisions to optimize this for a specific general case of the system. But there are times where you can get a measurable improvement in throughput by making changes to things like the tunables and proxys or the tunables and slash sys 
And the way that we manage that is through the TuneD daemon and the TuneD D profiles. Um, so if you are a Microsoft SQL consumer, for example, uh, there is a TuneD profile to set up those parameters in Proxys and SlashSys to optimize them for a MS SQL workload. But it's important to realize that when you optimize your system for something specific, things your system may be doing that's not in that list of specific items may not do as well. So um, there are some kind of like general TuneD profiles, like there's one called throughput performance effect. Um, let's see, can I show you what they look like? Yeah. <clears throat> All right, I just want to verify that we can see the terminal here. Yep, I got you. Might bump the right. phone up just a little bit though. <clears throat> Let me see. Actually, just the uh, the the font size uh, selector there in the terminal. Would... Oh, I got it. Perfect. All right. Maybe so it's just my old eyes. To, to the ADM uh, list. All right, so these are the profiles that are installed on the machine currently. Um, and some that are interesting might be um, this one, throughput performance. And it turns out that some of our others are based off of this one, right? It's a, and you can read the description. Broadly applicable tuning that provides excellent performance across a variety of common services, uh, server workloads, um, or virtual guest. So virtual guest is if your machine is actually a virtual machine or cloud instance, these are some settings that you might be interested in. Um, and so I won't go into the details unless you guys want me to, I'll like show you the nitty gritty, but things like um, virtual guest as an example will disable um, IO elevators, right? So if you're running on top of somebody else's box, then if you arrange all of your disk IO and then send it to the hypervisor, the hypervisor will then rearrange all of that disk IO that you spent a bunch of time arranging to then send it out to whatever the next thing is. Um, so you've essentially like wasted all of that time and effort to do the arrangement to just have someone else rearrange it. So um, in virtual guest, it sets the disk elevator at no op, which is as it comes, just send it out. Uh, and then the hypervisor will receive that and do all the arrangement to make sure that it's, um, you know, best formatted for the workloads running on that hypervisor. So those are the types of decisions that one would make by choosing a TuneD profile. Um, where you would run into problems is if you did something like set yourself a virtual guest profile or set yourself up as a virtual guest profile, but you are actually a bare metal box running some really disk IO intensive workload which would benefit from that IO scheduling, but you turned it off because you said that you were a virtual machine, right? So having those uh, mismatches can cause performance problems um, that, that maybe you weren't expecting. Uh, but TuneD actually does a pretty good job of looking at your system and uses things like uh, Virtu to figure out that you're a virtual machine and will automatically make some of these choices for you. I want to throw out one thing too. If, if you need to go beyond the TuneD profile and, and and kind of manually set some you know kernel kernel settings under you know slash proc slash sys, we also have a, a kernel settings uh, rel system role, and and you can use that to automate you know deploying deploying these these configurations across a you know a fleet of systems. So that's always an option too if you need to go you know one step beyond the, the pre built TuneD profiles. There it is. We got system roles in on the episode. That's the first Brian's reference. Happy. Yeah, first reference. <laughs> of me. Well, and system that system role actually uses TuneD behind the scenes to store that value right. that you want to change yep. permanently. Yep. <laughs> so you mentioned that uh, that Red Hat Enterprise Linux is good at uh, capturing data and analyzing it, and I I think uh, we could go back into. Uh, into the web console and and dive in some more into what that actually means, because while while we don't have more of the alerting piece of of system monitoring, which is something that a Nagios or 
Um, I know when uh, when I was a sysadmin, like Solar Winds was one of the big ones uh, that I came across frequently. Uh, but uh, so RHEL doesn't do the the alerting piece of it, but we do collect a lot of those metrics, and we can actually uh, see what a system is doing in real time. And and we we joke, but uh, Brian and and his uh, product management team do a lot of work around the web console, and that that ties a lot into this performance uh, conversation. Yeah, and uh, in fact, when we take a look at um, Web Console, when you log in on the very front page, right, this overview page under the usage uh, tile, there's that view metrics and history. And if you click on it, um, it takes you a page that gives you some additional performance related analytics for this specific machine. Um, so you get things like it's top using applications and how memory is being consumed and uh, disk and network throughput. But then you also get this section down at the bottom, which is being fed by um, uh, a package called Performance Copilot, which collects a whole bunch of performance data about the machine. And then the cockpit is, uh, or web console is um, graphing it. So you can see things like uh, here we have a CPU spike and a network I.O. spike that was detected at 140. Uh, you can kind of see overall what your memory usage looks like or your disk I.O. usage. Um, and thanks to the web console, um, it will not only get the data from Performance Copilot, but it also do these little things where it will identify when something odd happens. Uh, and it turns out this machine isn't doing anything super special. This is just a un unusual spike um, and nothing else was happening. But in the case where you were doing some troubleshooting and you were having problems, you might come in here and just very quickly be able to see that these kinds of events were occurring. And when you toggle that little arrow open, um, you get a selection of logs from around the time this thing happened. So if you are troubleshooting, it's kind of an a very easily and convenient first stop for, let me see what's happening. Oh, and here's a bunch of unusual events. Let me take a look at the log messages from around this event. Maybe one of those will be very immediately uh, revealing as to what this problem might be around. One, one other thing I want to point out that we added just, just in the 9.1 and 8.7 is um, up at the top where it shows the CPU, if, if you're on a like a bare metal system, it'll actually show you the CPU temperature now, which is which is kind of cool and oh, cool. It can also be relevant. You know, if, if you know if you, uh, I've been in a situation before where we had um, you know a cooling issue in a data center, and you know that can definitely affect the systems negatively. So so you can now you, you'll be able to log in and, and see that CPU temperature up there at the top, which is kind of cool. So you can tell when your boxes are literally on fire. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It'll, yeah it, over a certain temperature, it'll, it'll show a warning, and then it'll go to like a, you know, an error. You know, so yeah, it's it's pretty cool. Actually, didn't know that. So I'm I'm looking up my my home system here. Yeah, there's there's actually yeah. Just on a side note, there's actually all kinds of really cool stuff and. Uh, Rel 9.1 and 8.7 for the web console. I'm working on a blog now where I'm highlighting all the all the new stuff. So hopefully, you know, check the Red Hat blog here in a couple of weeks, and hopefully that'll be out. So, uh, Brian, I was monitoring another um, another video that we had through a content creator, and um, he recommended web console or cockpit as part of his like why you should use Rel. And in the comments, a whole bunch of people were like, you can use cockpit on Ubuntu too. And it's like, <laughs> you can. Because of the top 35 committers to cockpit, they're all Red Hatters. You're welcome. <laughs> so Scott, what, like if you, so say you, you were a, a rel administrator, um, and, and you received a call for a performance issue. Is that where you're starting? Are you starting in the web console? Are you starting at that at that spot? What, what tools are you using and, and kind of what's your workflow look like? So I think it depends on the, um, on the organization. 
right? I've been to organizations where they actually have a centralized place where they accumulate their performance data and they have one of those, you know, central monitoring systems. And that might be where I started because that's my repository of information. I know that you're going to take us through something in just a second about that, Brian. Um, but yeah, like, you know, it's, it's been a minute since I've been woken up at three in the morning to diagnose uh, performance issues. But having something like web console for the machine would be really handy because it allows me to graphically see what's happening. Whereas in the olden days, we would just like pull up a bunch of text data and have to parse it at three in the morning to figure out what looked odd uh, to then begin to, to figure out what the next steps are. And the next steps are usually things like um, looking at system applications Right, so something like top maybe, or uh, VM stat or IO stat to give you kind of this broad what's going on on the system right now. And once you identify your problematic application, then you start to dig into other things like um, maybe S trace to figure out what that application is doing right now. Um, or more recently, we have things like the BCC tools which is a suite of applications that use the extended Berkeley packet filter or eBPF in kernel virtual machine and can report on a whole bunch of system diagnostic information that um, we didn't have just, I don't know, six years ago, seven years right. ago. Right. Another tool I was playing around with yesterday is um, that's in RHEL is called Flame Graph. And it's, it's pretty cool. You can you know, basically sample the system for a, a specified amount of time and then it will produce a uh, basically a, a graph of the stack trace and, and you can kind of you know see exactly where you know where the cpu is going it's a pretty cool tool and that's that's included um, in rel as well so one one thing um you know red has been investing a lot into is this uh thing called a resource optimization service can you tell us a little bit about that what what that is and what the benefits of that are yeah, so uh, I mentioned earlier that one of the things the performance engineering team has been spending a lot of time on is benchmarking on cloud instances. And if you've worked with uh, cloud providers, they will often have measurement applications to try and recommend what instance size you should assign to your to your instance, right? So they'll look at a whole bunch of cloud provider side data to then say, oh, you should use an M6 extra large uh, for this thing. Um, but that's one aspect of the of measurement, right? So what we've been doing is we've been doing these benchmarks and then feeding that data into a console.redhat.com service called research optimization, or sorry, resource optimization. Um, and so if you hook your machines up using the insights client, it will report usage and performance data to resource optimization. And then resource optimization will also make suggestions on what type of instance would better suit your workload. And so for example, um, there's uh, a bunch of different M6 instance types at Amazon, just using them as an example. Um, but one of them is an AMD based processor. And one of them is an Intel based processor. And one of them is Intel based processor processor, but with limited network connectivity or more limited network connectivity. And so um, based off of that checking, we can go, oh, you know, if you went to the Intel version, if you were an AMD or the AMD version, if you were an Intel, you could get this or that. Uh, or one of the things that I've seen that's pretty interesting is if you are running a workload that does not do a bunch of network IO, but does a bunch of disk and um, CPU utilization, that third one that has the limited network information or network capability per dollar is a lot less expensive than the others. So that might be the best match for the workload that you're running. Um, and so that's what the resource optimization service does is it takes this performance engineering generated data and then takes your machine data and tries to make a recommendation for how you can get uh, the best bang for the buck, so to speak.
Well, why don't we dive in? And uh, I think, uh, I think Brian, you've got uh, a bit of a demo. Uh, although first, I, I made a promise in the chat. Scott, how do you feel about a, a bit of a stump the chump real quick? Uh, I will be severely stumped, but we'll, we'll give it a whirl. <laughs> um, so I, I think we can make this a, a more general question as well. But the question was, uh, how much performance benefit would you expect by running WireGuard in kernel mode versus user mode on a server or client with RHEL 9.x? And I think we can zoom out a little bit and maybe approach this for from how do I, which would be better, running something in kernel or in user mode, whether it's WireGuard or an application or some kind of security tool? Um, or, uh, and then the follow-up to that was, uh, or what tools would you use to measure that? So uh, before I can answer that question, there are a whole bunch of additional questions. So for <laughs> example, uh, what kind of throughput are you using with your WireGuard whatever? Um, so if you're not doing a lot of traffic, then it probably wouldn't make much difference whether you ran it in kernel mode or user mode, right? So if there's not a lot of traffic, I would probably say none. There will be no difference. Um, if you are loading it up and it's actually operating as um, you know something in the edge of your network where it's routing a ton of traffic, then you know, probably it would benefit from being in kernel mode. But here's why. Because in kernel mode, it's running as a kernel process, which is much easier to circumvent or uh, preempt other processes running on the machine. So what you're going to see is that you're giving preferential treatment to these WireGuard-based operations uh, that you weren't seeing or maybe weren't as, as easily seen when it was running in user mode or user space, right? So things like nice value don't really affect kernel running applications. Um, when there's a preemptive multitasking thing where we have to decide what to switch on or off the processor, uh, kernel related jobs are most likely preferred. So what you may notice is all of a sudden things like the bash shell on that host gets sluggish as it's preempting your bash shell because it's a user space tool for kernel space things. Um, so would your WireGuard workload benefit from that? Probably yes. How much? Depends on traffic. And then are you actually creating other performance problems for yourself? Because now the people logging in are like, gosh, it's so slow because I can't type so fast, right? which is really a perception problem because it's doing much better at the job it's supposed to be doing. But because they don't know what that is, it uh, generates like complaints and, and angst because it's affecting other things on the system. Funny, I have, so I that have was customers little... back in the day that sounded just like that. Exactly. That was my, that was my like obnoxious user voice, by the way. <laughs> All right, so if you're <laughs> if you're watching live, uh, definitely throw your chat uh, your questions into chat. Uh, Ivan, you you tried, uh, didn't manage to stump Scott, so we'll we'll have to try an, another round. But maybe uh, maybe once Brian walks us through uh, kind of a getting started demo, maybe we'll have some other questions and we can try and stump Scott live on the air, which would make make pretty much my CY twenty three. I, I should make that a performance goal: stump Scott live on air. That, that that's a new one. <laughs> All right, so what I'm going to be talking about here or showing is, you know, using a, a met, our, our metrics rel system role. And so what this allows you to do is automate the process of configuring both performance copilot and optionally Grafana in your environment. So what we're going to do in this demo is there's four different rel hosts. These are all running rel 9.1. Um, you can see across the top here, I have, um, you know, rel, rel2, rel3, and then later on, we'll have a rel4 as well. And so what I'm, you know, the end goal, what I'd like to do here is set up this rel host so that it's my central Grafana server, and I can view performance metrics from these other three hosts. Um, now, if you've ever, you know, set up performance copilot before, if you've set up, you know, things like Grafana before, you, you, you probably realize, you know, that this can be a quite involved process if you're doing this manually and by hand, especially if you have, you know, a large environment. And so the whole point of the metrics role is to automate this process, make it, make it easier 
and make it so you can you know deploy it um, effectively. All right. So with that with that background, let's let's go ahead and get started. Um, and, and one other thing, I'll, I'll throw out real quick. So the lab I'm going through here, this is available on lab.redhat.com. Um, you, you can try this out yourself and, and walk through exactly what I'm going through and, and experiment with it uh, if you'd like to try it out. All right. First thing we're going to do is um, install the RHEL system roles package. This is part of, uh, you know, included as part of RHEL. And this will also install Ansible core um, as a dependency. So once this is done, we'll have everything we need to use the metric system role. All right, so let's keep going here. So um, we're gonna go on to the next, um, next part portion of this lab. And what we'll do next is we're going to work on creating a, an inventory file and a playbook um, to, to call the metrics role. So we'll start by creating a directory. And then we're going to create this inventory file. Let me clear the screen here and I'll, I'll redisplay it here so you can see it a little bit better. Okay. So our inventory file here, um, this is an Ansible inventory file. And, and essentially what we need to do with any of the rel system roles is we use variables to instruct the role um, and what, we, what we'd like it to do. So what we're gonna do here is we have two different groups um, defined. Um, we have a servers group and we have a metrics monitor group. So the servers group is going to be all of the client systems you'd like to monitor. And you can see under the servers group, we have rel two and rel three. And then we have some variables defined for these, these hosts. So we have um, the firewall system role will be used to open the PMCD service, which is part of Performance Copilot. And then we're also gonna set this uh, metrics retention days. This is from the metrics role. This, you know, specifying we'd like to retain seven days of, of metrics on these hosts. Okay, moving on to the metrics monitor group. Um, there's only one host in this group, which is the rel host. Um, we're going to use the firewall role on, on this host to open the Grafana service. And then we're going to specify we'd like to have the graph and que query service set to yes. So this is what's going to cause this, um, this host to become our central Grafana server. And then we need to tell it what host we'd like it to monitor. And we're just going to simply refer back to the servers group up here, which includes, you know, rel two and rel three. So we're basically saying we'd like it to monitor rel two and rel three um, in this example. All right, so with all that said, um, next we need to create a very simple playbook to call, call these roles. So let me um, display this. Okay, so this is a very, very sh short and simple playbook. Um, we are first going to run against the server's host. Again, the, this will be rel two and rel three. And we're gonna you know, basically tell it to run the metrics role and then run the firewall role. And this will read in those variables we define in the inventory. And then after that, we'll run against the metrics monitor host, which is the rel host that I'm on here. And again, we'll just run the metrics and firewall role. And this is going to, going to go through and set up you know, Grafana and, and open up Grafana in the firewall. All right, so with all that said, let's go ahead and run the run the playbook here. Now this is going to take um, this is going to take you know three or four minutes to run. Um, just just real briefly while this is running, um, just to explain what these different colors mean. Um, when you're running a an Ansible playbook, um, you'll see you know these different colors pop up. The green essentially means um, that item was checked on the remote host and it was found that it was already, you know, set to what the playbook specifies. So nothing was done. It is basically validated. It's set correctly. I don't need to do anything. Um, you'll also see this uh, blue color. This indicates it was skipped over. Um, this is usually because the playbook will have some logic um, where, you know, certain conditions specify what should be run and what shouldn't be run. So, you know, oftentimes you'll see things skipped over due to that. And then you'll see the, the orange orange color here where it says change. This means um, it actually did have to make a change on a system. Um, and so report changed on that host. Um, another color hopefully we won't see in this example is red. That would indicate the, uh, the task had failed. Um, one other thing to point out with, you know, with, with Ansible, you know, 
most most of the most of the things you run with Ansible are what's referred to as impotent, meaning you can run them, um, or you can run the playbook a second time. And uh, if, if the playbook is properly set up to be impotent, then um, it shouldn't make any additional changes if everything's still at the set to the desired state. So, um, so for example, you know we should be able to run this one time; it'll make all the changes. We should be able to run it again, and it'll basically just validate everything's still set properly. Um, if anything did happen to change on a remote host, it'll change it back to what it should be. But in general, it should you know usually report that nothing else was changed unless you know something happened to be changed on the remote host in the meantime. All right. So, with all that said, let's uh, let's have some discussion here while we're waiting for this. Um, Eric and Scott, what's your favorite system role and why? So. <laughs> I and just it. like that, he stole the show. It's going to say the show is going to be renamed Rel System Rules Present. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it'll be Rel System Rules Theater or yeah, Studio. There, studio. Yeah, that's, that's the goal. Yeah, that was the deal when I when I came on, Eric. So <laughs> I, I must not have read the uh, the fine print well enough. <laughs> uh, so I actually like the uh, kernel setting system role, um, which which is pretty obnoxious considering our episode today. Um, the other thing I like is the time sync role, which is used in this lab as well, because uh, just figuring out whether you're using NTPD or crony, and then like the bajillion settings that you could have for NTP is obnoxious, and uh, time sync makes that really easy. Yeah, yeah, the time sync one is pretty cool with, with how it will, yeah. It knows the target version of, of RHEL. It knows what it should do, um, and, it, and it does the right thing. And it's a good example of the system roles being that, that consistent interface you know, into RHEL. So if we change things between major versions, um, you know, we try to abstract that away from the end user if you're using the system role, because it's that consistent, that consistent interface into you know, managing RHEL. So can I say that? Uh... I just need a system role for managing all my system roles. <laughs> That's a good idea. <laughs> um, if I had to pick, I, I can only narrow it down to a pair. Uh, it, it would be the SSH server and SSH client system roles. Um, that was something that, you know, we, as a sysadmin, you try and manually roll out an improvement to your SSH environment, make something more secure. Um, and then you realize that you forgot an entire batch of servers uh, that were off in some random data center or some uh, legacy application that no one logs into. Then you realize, oh, I can't log in with my user account because we didn't set up you know, authentication or something correctly on this system. So having the ability to, at scale, manage my SSH client and server relationship, probably uh, just looking back on, on my days as a sysadmin just really, right. really sings. Right. <laughs> All right, cool. So this, yeah, yeah, go ahead. The requirement. It was tell Brian which of his children you love the most. <laughs> I thought you weren't supposed to pick favorite children. <laughs> oh, well, it's okay, because we're picking Brian's favorite children. Yeah, that, yeah, that's, that's oh, okay. 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 That's okay. Good, good, yeah. good. <laughs> all right, so, all right, cool. So that, so the, the role completed. So we should be, you know, set up with, with you know Grafana on, on the on the rel host it should be set to monitor our, our rel two and rel three host. So let's let's keep going through the lab here, and um, you know we'll log into Grafana and actually check out what this looks like. All right. So what we're going to do now is I'm going to click on the rel Grafana console button here. Oh, I might need to share. Let me try sharing this tab. Okay. Okay. Yep. That's coming through now. Okay. All right. So I'm going to log in with the with the default um, password here. Normally, you'd want to go ahead and change this um, to a, a more secure password, but I'm going to go ahead and skip that for now, just for the sake of this demo. All right. So we're now we're now logged into Grafana, um, and there's just one thing we need to do here. Um, we're going to go to the data sources, and we're going to go to PCP Redis. And then we're just going to click on save and test. And then we should be able to go to the dashboard. And we're going to be using the host overview uh, dash, 
dashboard. Okay. So let's go and click on that. Okay. So um, I'm going to change the the time frame here. You know, one thing you'll notice is we just installed this just a minute ago, so we only have a you know a couple of minute of, of performance stats here. Normally, if this had been running for a while, you know, these graphs will be full of full of information. But what we can do is go up to here to the drop down, and you can see the three different hosts that we have in the environment. So I can switch uh, between any of these hosts to see their um, specific performance information. And there is a there's just a ton of of good information in here. So we have um, you know things like the load average, memory utilization. We have CPU um, stats. Um, this goes down to things like you know context switches per second. Um, you know more in depth memory statistics. You know page fault rates. Um, then this down here is the the section on the different network um, metrics. So we'll have you know things like throughput, drops, packets, etc. Um, even things like TCP timeouts. Just just really a, a wealth of information um, if you're trying to 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 troubleshoot a performance issue. Um, down here at the bottom, um, at the end here, we have different performance metrics related to disk um, disk throughput and latency. So if you if you are struggling, you know, to to be able to have tools in your environment to effectively monitor this kind of information, you know, we'd highly recommend you check out the metrics uh, system role. Again, this is all 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 of what I'm showing you here is included in RHEL. Um, this is all this is all supported with your RHEL subscription. So um, if you're a RHEL customer, you already have access to this. So I'd highly re recommend you take take advantage of it. Um, all right, so <clears throat> there's a couple other things we, we could we could do in this lab um, as far as doing like a stress test and stuff. <clears throat> Eric and Scott, do, you, do we want to keep going on this lab, or are there other things you want to you want to talk about? Uh, why don't we circle back to it? Let's uh, okay. let's let some performance data populate, and we can okay. come back to this. Uh, Sounds see. good. Uh, one of the things that we were going to talk about, and we've we've kind of been bouncing around. <laughs> <laughs> um, is we talked about 2D profiles and we talked about the web console, but we didn't talk about selecting 2D profiles in the web console. So, uh, Scott or uh, Brian, do you, one of you guys still have the web console up and handy? That would be Brian, because I killed off my machine like that. <laughs> you know what? I, I don't, but I'll, I will, I'm going to go to lab.redhat.com and... I will start. wait for two minutes for it to provision. I'll uh, tell you what. Tell you what. I, I I got this. Give give me a second here to get logged in. I can. Uh... So I I uh, no not lab dot. How about my lab? There we go. Yeah, I can uh, let me fix the zoom on this real quick. So what I'll do is I'll share out my screen here. And grab the right tab. So one of the things I'm really excited about having is uh, <clears throat> is my Linux home lab. Um, and what I've got is a RHEL 9.1 machine on bare metal that's running uh, just a few virtual machines right now. I'm actually getting ready to gut my lab environment and try and build it out uh, with best practices, uh, things like image builder, uh, and yes, Brian, system roles, um, and, uh, and some other automation security, any, any of the things that we're, we're working on currently at, at Red Hat here to, to make, uh, to make my home environment a little bit more secure, a little bit more performant. Uh, let's see. Level. <coughs> okay. So if I go down here to view metrics and history, we can see that even while the episode was running, um, now I've got 24 cores. They're not doing too much right now. Uh, there was a load spike uh, about eight minutes ago. I could see what's going on there. Um, so I've got some Podman pods that are running. You can see that uh, Podman ran a health check. Just a few things like that. But if I come over here to the side... Uh -oh. should, should be under overview. Overview, that's right. Yep. And then, yeah, if you scroll down to the configuration... 
There it is. So you notice that um, you notice this performance profile. This is actually tied into Tune D, and this is one area where I've made a slight adjustment because um, Red Hat Enterprise Linux is really good about uh, analyzing your system, deciding if it's a virtual machine or a physical host. Uh, and I noticed that um, I'm, I'm running a sort of a hybrid environment here at home. I've got a series of virtual machines, but I've also got a series of Podman pods. I don't think I have anything running in bare RPMs anymore. Uh, so when it noticed that I had virtual machines, the performance profile defaulted to uh, to uh, hypervisor host uh, or virtual machine host, I should say. So if we come in and, and look at some of the different choices, uh, let's see, uh, virtual host is what it was called. Uh, but this system isn't primarily a, uh, a hypervisor, um, although it will be moving forward. So instead, I, I actually switched it up to throughput performance just so I can get the most performance out of it. The system's always on, it's always running, so I'm not too worried about power drain. Um, so just so I can kind of get the best balance between container host and virtual machine host. Uh, actually, nowadays, it's uh, actually the recommended one. So uh, back when I built the machine, it was actually a virtual host. So that's kind of cool to see that, uh, that it noticed that I'm kind of running both containers and virtual machines on this host and, and adjusted uh, appropriately. So, um, but yeah, I can come in here, and if I wanted to, I could change it. Maybe, uh, maybe I want to have a graphical environment. I can actually switch it over to a desktop and do some some. Uh, I've got a GPU in the server, so maybe I do some uh, some transcoding or something of videos, uh, some rendering um, for for some of the video content we put out on YouTube, things like that. Um, but I can do all that from within the web console. <coughs> well, I've got this up. Is there any anything else inside of web console we want to take a look at from a per performance perspective? No, I think we've I think we've covered we've covered most of it. Um, one one other one other thing that we that we uh, enhanced in eight point seven and nine point one that I'll just mention. Um, you know, in the web console, when you go to that um, performance section, it'll s show you the um, the top services that are running for CPU and memory. Um, we we enhanced that in, in eight point seven and, and nine point one, so it'll now also show. Um, Podman containers in that list. So if you have a container taking a lot of um, CPU or memory, it'll s show up in that in those lists of top services. Yes, so that's all of my top top memory services. Yeah. Like, uh, yep. that's probably Plex right there using almost sixty gigs of memory. My wife may be streaming something at work today. <laughs> so, Eric, um, you said that you changed the performance from virtual host. Did you look at what the difference was between them? Uh, I did at the time, but that was about a year ago. <laughs> so the proof of performance uh, ends up being the profile that most of our other profiles are based on. So if I can uh, share my screen here. Sure. Um, we're just, I'm just looking at the virtual host Tune D configuration, uh, and you'll notice right here, it's based on throughput performance. So the extra stuff behind that is what makes this unique compared to throughput performance. So for example, it changes the, um, the ratio of dirty pages in memory before it starts doing um, uh, syncing. So that's one of the special things about uh, virtual guest and the, or sorry, virtual host. And then it's also this uh, force latency C state ID, no zero three seventy thing. Um, oh, it turns off power, power saving settings on your hypervisor. Um, so you get through performance plus these couple other things that might be beneficial for running VMs. That'll be something I, I'll end up changing back then as, uh, as I build out this more uh, golden image blessed environment. I mean, again, smart people that work at Red Hat and make decisions. Look at that. 
so nice. They 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 do all the hard stuff so that I don't have to. I mean, if only there was uh, Sir Ruth Gooey, your favorite. If you're wondering where that came from, there was a uh, a spirited debate last week on Into the Terminal about server with GUI versus server with no GUI, and I think popular opinion was no GUI. Brian, where where do you stand on that? Let, let's throw Scott under the bus here. <laughs> so, I, 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 yeah, I'm, I'm I'm of the opinion, you know, no GUI, and then use the web console. So, which you'll you'll be proud of me, Brian. That is exactly what I said live on air. No GUI, but web console yep. all the way. Yep. And system roles. He threw in system roles just for good measure. Yeah, yeah. I mean, of course, I mean that's just a given. Like there, there was never a question. <laughs> so. so the bit of context that you're missing, Brian, is we were talking about the default <laughs> choice of package group to install through the installer. And Eric said something very inflammatory that like, oh, I would never choose this default. <laughs> uh, and and that's how we got started on it. Yeah, the default settings, those those can be uh, pretty tough decisions on, on, on what we make the default. And uh, a lot of debate if, on that. <laughs> if, if you're part of the uh, image building team, not image builder, but part of the team that builds out the defaults for our installer, send all of your hate mail to scott.mcbryan at redhat.com. <laughs> then then I'll, I'll be sure to read it. That's not my actual email address. <sighs> Oh goodness, we we have gone off the rails here. So so uh, Brian, why don't why don't we go back to the uh, to the system you're you're showing us, and let's take a look at some of the performance data. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So okay, so <laughs> what what I did here is I just went ahead and run use the stress utility to you know create some create some load on both the rel two and rel three systems. So this ran for a minute. Um, let me go back to. Um, Grafana here, and you can see, um, you know, when I ran that, you can see, you know, all these different graphs for different areas on the system spiked up during that time. Um, you know, so just just trying to show here, you know, kind of what what this looks like and how you can identify um, identify a, a spike. You can also hover over these different areas of the graph and see, you know, specific metrics for those different um, time periods. Um, now, one other thing we can do, let me um, go back to this screen here, is um, we can show <laughs> you know, how you can add an additional host into this environment, right? We started with RHEL, RHEL 2 and RHEL 3 as our clients. What if we had another host we brought online? You know, how would we add this into this environment? Well, it's super, super easy to do. I'm going to run, uh, run this command here. This is going to rewrite my inventory file, but, but really all, all it did... Um, it really just added this extra rel4 host under my servers group. So before that was just rel2 and rel3. Um, now we also have um, rel4 on there. So once we've done that, all we need to do is just rerun the playbook just like we did before. Um, again, you know, as, as I mentioned before, um, due to this being idempotent, you'll see on rel2 and rel3, the ones we already set up, all the tasks on them are going to come back is okay because it's everything's already set up on those. And then on rel four, our new host will come back through and say, say it was changed. Um, so we don't need to wait for this to, to run again, but um, you know, after a couple of minutes here, what, what would happen is we would be able to go into Grafana, refresh the screen, and we'd also see, you know, rel four in there at, available to see the metrics from. So. And that was, good, that, was, that was good timing. So, <laughs> so we would accept the lab died. <laughs> you, get, you get the labs for an hour. That, that's that's the, uh, the catch. You know, the, the labs are completely free to use, um, but you get them for an hour. <laughs> so, well, fi 51 to 53 minutes, depending on. Okay. That. Oh, goodness. Oh, goodness. <laughs> And I love how Scott and I managed to start yet another flame war in the chat over server no GUI versus GUI. But uh, as as we wrap up today, Brian, I I have a brilliant idea. This is this is my money making scheme here at Red Hat. What we need to do, and maybe we can get this done before Summit, we need system role T-shirts. They can say system roles. This is the way. 
Well, I mean, we we did have the the stickers, right, in Ansel Fest. So. I might but, have snagged a couple of those yeah, System so, Wars stickers for myself. Yeah, maybe so I, can, very, I can neither confirm nor deny. <laughs> very limited edition. You had to have gone to Ansel Fest, or I, I still have some. So if you can come to <laughs> come see me at an event, I'll, I'll I'll have them in my backpack. So. So just so you know, that's a competing T-shirt idea to one that I uh, floated by Gunner yesterday, which was uh, Red Hat Enterprise Linux ruining the community since advanced server 2.1 with systemd kvm tundi cockpit wayland and with that we can never let uh let brian mcbrian back on the on the show <laughs> but i would buy that shirt <laughs> all I right mean, folks go ahead go ahead I was going to say, the, the amount of stuff that started as Red Hat technologies that end up being just general use Linux technologies is astounding. Still upset you took away my init. Actually, no, not at all. <laughs> not at all. I, I went to systemd and went, this makes sense. Why did we use the other thing for so long? <laughs> anyway, before... <laughs> Before we start a an actual flame war in the chat, we should probably wrap this episode up. And uh, <laughs> we have fun in the realm of you. So if if you're looking for a job, we'll find you a position. <laughs> it may end up being mine. We don't know. <laughs> I can't wait to see the hate mail from this episode. <laughs> With that said, thank you all so much for joining us, Scott. It's always a pleasure to have you uh, have you uh, join us and. And uh, it's, it's awesome for episode 51 to have you back to to reprise your role on RHEL Presents and really appreciative that uh, that you handed off the reins to me. I'm, I'm sorry for what we've done to your baby, but uh, <laughs> on behalf of Scott, my, my co-host Brian Smith, and the entire Red Hat Enterprise Linux team, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, if you have any further questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I know uh, Brian, Mick Brian, and myself all, uh, all check the comments on a regular basis, so... Definitely ask your questions, and we will be back in two weeks to talk about RHEL uh, and what uh, what RHEL means at the edge. And then Scott and I will actually be live Friday to talk, uh, ironically, about virtual machines. We'll be talking about how to manage virtual machines from the command line, and we might even throw in some web console just for Brian. But uh, until then, y'all take care, and we'll see you next time on RHEL Presents. Thank you. <laughs>